Have you been diagnosed with depression and struggle with sadness? Maybe you're scared of being criticized. Loss of interest, aches and pain. I'm always thinking something terrible. Ask your doctor about effects or exile. Ask your doctor about Symbolta. Talk to your doctor about Zoloft. So talk to your healthcare professional. Talk your doctor talk today. To your doctor. Tell your doctor. Contact your doctor immediately. Talk with your doctor. <laughs> Over 40 years ago, leading psychiatrists met in Puerto Rico to map out their vision of the future. We see a developing potential for nearly a total control of human emotional status, mental functioning, and will to act. Their plan? To create by the year 2000 a range of psychiatric drugs regulating every aspect of human behavior. Uh, diagnosed with uh, depression and put on Paxil. ADD and I was prescribed Ritalin. General anxiety disorder. Prescribed Zoloft. Bipolar disorder and I take lithium. PTSD, Zoloft. I was on Paxil. And they placed me on Zoloft. They gave me Adderall. I was prescribed Cyptamu. Tegretol. Lexapro. Debaco. Stelazine. Adderall. Concerta. Lorazine. Prozac. Lorazepam. Epixol. Clonazepam. The Ritalin. Dexafetamine. Paxil. Silert. Prozac. The Adderall. Elavil. Depico, Wilbutrin, Seroquel. Etc. Etc. 100 million people worldwide are on psychiatric drugs. How did this happen? Psychiatrists convinced them they were sick. They want you to think you're diseased from birth and that all those experiences of life, childhood and adolescence and teenage years and adulthood and being a senior citizen, that these are all various stages of disease. Because let's face it, we've all been depressed at one time, we've all been anxious at one time. These are normal emotions that we feel. Every emotional and spiritual problem is reduced to a label. And of course all of those diseases require pharmaceutical treatments. This is big, big business. While generating a healthy income, claiming to be medical professionals, psychiatrists will freely confess that their profession is devoid of science. We don't really have any specific blood tests or other tests that are definitive for any mental illness whatsoever. It would be neat if it would become much more scientific. Well, if you go to my office and you tell me that you're depressed, there's nothing, and no blood sample, whatever, no tests. There are not uh, current available tests uh, to verify your diagnosis. I don't use any tests. You do not have a test to say, well, this is this disorder, and this is the best medication for this disorder. For many years, we thought we had the tests nailed down, but it turned out that they weren't of any value. If you don't know what's causing the symptoms, then to give somebody something to alleviate the symptoms is close to impossible. By the time a drug's approved and it hits the general population, we don't know even 50% of the side effects that are involved with that drug. And these pills cause heart attacks and liver problems and immune system problems and lots of other medical problems. So you're playing with fire. Every day, psychotropic drugs cause serious adverse reactions. And while psychiatrists and drug companies fully understand the dangers of the drugs they sell, their unsuspecting customers are left to suffer the consequences. Everything became worse. Every, uh, you know, each, each mood swing was worse. He would have chronic headaches, chronic, you know, nausea, not feeling good. She was very agitated, um, very, very jumpy. She was having horrible hallucinations. Her personality was, um, disintegrating. Once he started on that drug, he just, the cloud just stayed over him and stayed over him and stayed over him. It got darker and darker. He thought there wasn't anything worth loving to kill himself. That was not Matthew. That was the drugs. At least I would like to have said, I love you. I didn't get a chance to do that. In addition to crippling scores of people daily, every month, psychiatric drugs kill an estimated 3,000. But the human devastation would never have gotten this high if psychiatrists hadn't worked hand in hand with drug companies to promote their drugs to doctors throughout the world. Today, 70% of all psychiatric drugs are prescribed by general physicians. And how was this accomplished? Marketing. It's about creating a good story that uses science that convinces a physician 
to think about writing a prescription. This is not science. This is incredibly effective marketing. It has nothing to do with science. They use what I call statistical contortionism. Basically just skew the numbers, make everything look fantastic. You hide the bad numbers. They're learning every trick in the book. They're evolving into efficient marketing machines. And it's working. There's definitely an unholy alliance between psychiatry and pharmaceutical sales. That's a marriage made in heaven. They're like conjoined twins. They're joined at the wallet. And with 374 mental disorders filling psychiatry's diagnostic manual and more on the way, business is booming. Pharmaceutical companies have expanded their roster of psychotropic drugs from 44 in 1966 to 174 today. The top five psychotropic drugs combined gross more money than the gross national product of each of over half the countries on Earth. Altogether, the psychiatric industry rakes in a third of a trillion dollars a year. How could this have happened? It's a tale of deception that may be difficult to believe, but fatal to ignore. We took him to a psychiatrist, and within a matter of minutes, yeah, she's ADHD, and here's your drug. And on the Medicaid, and five minutes later, he was on Zyprexa. He saw the psychiatrist who prescribed the medicine for 20 minutes. The guy didn't even look at her. He talked to her a little bit. Now, how can you tell if somebody's ADHD or not ADHD from just a few minutes talking to her? Next thing I know, I'm getting handed a, a handful of Xanax. That's how easy it is to get these drugs. Just so easy. It was just passed to me like candy. That's simple. If a person were to walk in off the street, sat down with a psychiatrist, the chances of him being prescribed a drug before he were to leave the office, I would have to put it at 100%. Psychiatrists prescribe drugs. They might have different ways of diagnosing, they might have different ways of interacting with a patient, but it's rare to find a psychiatrist that uses no drugs. The psychiatrists today are, in quotes, admitting they can't cure these mental illnesses and they're therefore going to manage your illness by using a drug. Fifty years ago, a person who was going through a divorce would have relied on family, friends, clergy, and even the family doctor to a certain extent for conversation to work through the issue. They certainly wouldn't have been medicated. That was before the era of psychotropic drugs. Psychiatrists, occupying the lowest rung of the medical profession, worked almost exclusively in mental institutions. With no cures, there was little chance they would ever be respected by the public and their peers as real doctors. Psychiatrists had for years been on the fringe of medicine. Typically, the standard doctor internist would have very low regard for psychiatrists because it was understood not to be a very clear uh, science or art. Psychiatrists wanted to be viewed as physicians, as doctors. And in order to be viewed as physicians and doctors, the people they dealt with had to be viewed as patients. And if doctors dealt with diseases, then their patients had to be diseased. Psychiatrists had a wonderful opportunity, they felt, to become respected in the eyes of their peers. They raced to create a whole diagnostic book called the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which was created by consensus. A group of psychologists and psychiatrists get together and if they have made common observations they have a vote and they now classify a new disease and they give it a number and it graduates into the DSM classification. And it's a dangerous book. It's a book that has many disorders that could apply to any one of us because the disorders are not real medical diseases and it's things that apply to nearly all of us at times. Are you afraid of meeting new people? Are you afraid to speak in front of a large crowd of people? Uh, does it make you nervous to go and to talk to your boss about a complaint? You can invent a mental disorder based on a checklist of symptoms and that is exactly how the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the Billing Bible for Psychiatry, works. Since the DSM's first edition in 1952, the number of diagnoses has steadily grown. 
from a slender 130-page booklet listing 106 so-called mental disorders, the DSM has bloated to a voluminous 886 pages. It is only through the use of this book that psychiatrists can diagnose, drug, and bill for services. In fact, the psychiatric industry currently uses the DSM to collect over $72 billion in private and government insurance money. The DSM is used to diagnose and then give a label, and the label is used for billing purposes. That's how they get paid. You have to have a term in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual in order to then call it a disease and treat it as a disease and write a prescription for it. And so because they can vote it in, they can create and then the drug industry can just take over and market their drugs for those new disorders. And those drugs were welcomed by psychiatry leaders because it made us real doctors. Of course, first the public had to believe that there was something wrong with them and that that thing wrong was biochemical and that that could then be treated by a drug which was supposed to cure all. And so it was relatively easy, I think, to say, well, look, let's start looking at mental illness as fundamentally um, a matter of chemical imbalance in the brain. Chemical imbalance is a term that's used as a marketing ploy as opposed to anything that there's scientific evidence to support. Nobody has yet measured, demonstrated, or created a test to show that somebody has a chemical imbalance in their brain, period. How do you market a drug that restores the chemical balance or corrects a chemical imbalance? How can you do that? in good conscience if you don't even know what one is. The whole myth of the chemical imbalance was created to sell drugs. And while psychiatrists and drug companies have used this myth to make billions moving vast quantities of psychotropic drugs into the bodies of unsuspecting consumers, the public has paid the ultimate price. An estimated half of all Americans who commit suicide are on psychotropic drugs. Annually, psychotropic drugs are estimated to kill more than two and a half times more people than are killed by homicide. And who is entrusted with protecting the public against these dangerous psychotropic drugs? In the United States, it is the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, whose psychiatric drug advisory panels are dominated by psychiatrists who shuttle between the drug industry, academia, private practice, and government, the so-called revolving door. The revolving door at FDA is one of the primary reasons why the system that we have works so poorly. That revolving door is a direct result of the fact that a group of people with the same mindset are put into positions of being regulators and in the position of being formulators and sellers and marketers. The panels that are formed by the FDA to evaluate these drugs, the psychiatrists who are on those panels, almost all of them have conflicts of interest where they have directly or indirectly received funding from the very industry and the very parties within the industry whose drugs they are evaluating. So there's this, this tight little relationship between psychiatry, pharmaceutical industry, and FDA where they each mutually support each other and yet the mental health of the population does not improve. Take for example the FDA drug evaluation panel that approved the antidepressant Paxil. Every psychiatrist on that panel has financial ties to the pharmaceutical industry. And these conflicts of interest have been rampant enough to prompt congressional investigation. When I check these advisory committees who make recommendations to the FDA, and they're always approved, always approved after the advisory committee, I found that there were conflicts of interest. I found that many of the people on the advisory committees had never filed a proper report on stocks and bonds that they owned that, that might uh, be viewed as a conflict of interest, and they're by law supposed to do that. And this network of financial conflict of interest between psychiatry, the drug industry, and the FDA became even more entrenched in 1992, after passage of the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, also known as PDUFA. Through this bill, 
the FDA would be paid a fee of $100,000 per drug to ensure that psychotropic medications would be rushed through the approval process and into the hands of prescribers faster than ever. Congress told the FDA, your job is no longer to make sure drugs are squeaky clean safe before they get out on the market. Your job now is to hurry up and get new drugs on the market faster. It acted to set the priorities of the FDA so that if there was a fee paid for a particular drug approval, it could be put on the fast track and rushed to market with less than the usual scrutiny that the FDA would give it. And this fast track has traded safety for sales. Since the passage of PDUFA, time spent on drug evaluation plunged from almost two years in 1992 to only six months four years later. Meanwhile, the number of new drugs released to the public doubled. Though fast-tracking is disastrous for public safety, it reaps huge profits for psychiatry and the drug industry. Because the sooner a drug is approved, the sooner it makes money. And the money is big. Every day, the average psychotropic drug grosses over $7.7 .7 million. One drug, Zyprexa, rakes in almost $12 million daily. And even though FDA now charges over $1 million per new drug application, the pharmaceutical fast track shows no signs of slowing. If you look at the relationship between the FDA, the pharmaceutical industry, and the psychiatrists, there's some kind of game that they're playing there. And what is the game? Well, you could say it's money, definitely money. And when you follow the money, you realize that there is no money in health there's big money in disease. That's why all you hear about is managing disease or treating disease. You don't really talk about curing disease. And so psychiatrists have become mainstream doctors in America. And that is because of the pharmaceutical industry. They can thank the pharmaceutical industry because they become mainstream and because they have a lot more money than they used to. And the drug industry can thank them because now they have thousands of soldiers in their army distributing these drugs to everybody. From the smallest infant to the oldest senior citizen, no one is immune from any of the hundreds of fictitious disorders invented by psychiatrists that fuel a multi-billion dollar psychotropic drug industry. And every day, psychiatrists are casting their nets ever wider. And all it takes? Another psychiatric label. How many people do you know who have been diagnosed with a mental disorder? One. With a mental disorder? Um, two. I'm sure a couple. I know a few. About three or four personally. Probably four. Half a dozen? I'll say about nine. At least a dozen. I bet I could count 15. 20 that I personally know. My uh, oldest son is diagnosed. And my mother was diagnosed. A kid from uh, my childhood. Your friend the next boyfriend. Just my grandfather and cousins, a friend of mine, friends. My sister, my neighbors, two friends, a girlfriend, a niece, one friend. My mother, all my friends, everybody I know. An apparent flood of mental illness is all around us. Where is this coming from? Psychiatrists, whose diagnostic and statistical manual can label anyone walking the earth today as mentally ill. Psychiatrists, I believe, they look at every human being and they divide humans into two classes, clients and potential clients. We see this no more uh, prevalent in any field than in the field of the mental disorders, where one disease after another is invented and then popularized and the public is made to worry about it. It's a disease mongering. It's the selling of sickness, you know, sometimes it's a, it's a drug in search of a market and it's giving public awareness to minor conditions with the ultimate goal is to sell more medications. It's not caring for people. When you run out of symptoms, you don't have any more clientele to market to. So you have to invent disease. And with psychiatric medications, you can invent diseases all day long. Look at human variation. Everyday things like shyness, um, sadness, or even a situational 
depressions um, like grieving, postpartum depression, they all become studied and prescriptions start to get written for these drugs. Before these drugs were introduced in the market, people who had these conditions would not have been given any drug at all. And so it is the branding of a disease and it is the branding of a drug for the treatment of a disease that did not exist before the industry made the disease. Case in point, shyness, a common life situation voted by psychiatrists into their diagnostic and statistical manual under the name social anxiety disorder. You know, people are nervous. Well, they come up with, say, um, social anxiety disorder. SAD, they'll call it SAD. And the connotation is that everybody ought to be happy and that here's a drug that can make you happy. Uh, so that a common occurrence, which is every now and again everybody's sad, we ought to be treating with a drug. Well, then they'll get this PR firm to um, drum up uh, business for this. They'll put out all these studies that find, you know, there's so many people afflicted with this sad, you know, and they'll start putting it in magazines, they'll start putting it on TV, they'll start a patient advocacy group that say, you know, that we're all affected by this, and, and then they'll come out with Paxil works for this. So they go to the FDA and they said, well, we ran this study and this works for this new invented disorder. And that is sad, social anxiety disorder. And millions of people suffer from it. And it's purely fictional. It's, it's a normal human emotion that everybody experiences at certain times or another, but they make it into a disease. Paxil, once it got approved by the FDA as the first antidepressant to be used for social anxiety, it took off huge. And um, it just moved from number three in the market amongst its peer drugs to number one in the market. Social anxiety disorder is just one of many made-up psychiatric disorders fueling the boom in psychotropic drug prescription. Psychiatrists work to promote what the latest disease is going to be. These days, bipolar is getting that same type of promotion. Everybody's being educated about their bipolar illness. When in fact, we know having emotional ups and downs is distinctly human. Now bipolar is thrown around like water. You've got bipolar, I have bipolar. If I'm up today, I'm, I'm manic. If I go home tonight and I'm depressed because I'm tired, that shows I have bipolar disease. It's a lot of hokum. Have you ever worried um, with seeing all the increased media on it that you might have a mental disorder? Yes. And which one is that? Um, I would say bipolar. You know, they talk about bipolar a lot. Bipolar. I've known a lot of bipolar. Two friends from uh, both of them were like diagnosed with bipolar. Um, my neighbor, she was bipolar. I was diagnosed with bipolar. My mother had bipolar. He was actually bipolar. Schizophrenic bipolar. <laughs> bipolar and obsessive compulsive. Bipolar and ADHD. Bipolar disorder. Bipolar, yeah. Bipolar situation. Bipolar. 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 There are three personality disorders, and then the most recent is bipolar. And that's just been in the past year. Spearheading the popularizing of bipolar disorder, especially in children, is psychiatrist Dr. Joseph Biederman a paid speaker, advisor, and researcher for 25 different drug companies. In 1996, the drug companies funneled all this money to this Dr. Biederman, he's well known. He's the one that came up and said that there's bipolar disorder in little kids. This was unheard of. There was no bipolar disorder in any kids. He came up with the study and published the articles out all over the world, and other doctors followed his lead that bipolar is in little kids. Due to the constant promotion by Dr. Biederman and his colleagues, there has been a 4,000% increase of the diagnosis of bipolar in children since 1994, while the number of antipsychotics prescribed to them has leaped fivefold to an estimated 2.5 million prescriptions. In 2008, Dr. Biederman was exposed by a Senate investigation for failing to report $1.6 million in personal income from pharmaceutical companies. But the damage had been done. Because of the bipolar fad created by Dr. Biederman, antipsychotics, some of the most powerful psychotropic drugs being prescribed, are psychiatry's drug of choice. 
the top three best-selling antipsychotics together grows $25,000 every minute. And no matter how big the psychotropic drug industry gets, psychiatrists are hard at work providing the diagnoses to make it even bigger. Let's say this is the pie right here of the um, of a certain class of medications, and this is a pretty profitable pie, and everybody wants a piece of that pie. Um, but what would happen if we made that pie even bigger? And how you make the pie even bigger is by expanding the uses for those drugs. They've already got a drug that's approved on the shelf. They can just pull it off the shelf, and rename it, repackage it, and say, "Look, we've got a new drug." for a new illness. When Prozac's patent ran out, that Eli Lilly had to look for a new source of profits. So all they did was change the name of the drug from Prozac to Seraphim, change the color of the pill from green to pink, and marketed it for PMDD, which is newly introduced into this book. What it tells us is that if you can come up with a label, a diagnostic label, for a drug, then you can sell it like hotcakes. It's a business model, and it's a billion dollar business model, and it works, and it's gonna keep continuing. Today, anyone may unknowingly be taking a psychiatric drug, renamed, repackaged, and prescribed for non-psychiatric purposes. Zyban, prescribed as a cure for smoking, is actually the antidepressant Wellbutrin. Cymbalta, a psychiatric drug for depression and anxiety, is now being marketed as Yendrive for urinary incontinence. Psychiatric researchers are testing psychotropic drugs on such wildly varying conditions as obesity, alcoholism, gambling, hot flashes, herpes, nausea, itching, shivering, and excessive hair pulling. It is a pill for every ill and practically no one is being told how dangerous psychiatric drugs are. As a chemist, I'm making these drugs. They're proving deadly in our labs, and they're proving deadly in other labs. Dangerous, ineffective, causing the exact same thing they're supposed to treat. How are they selling them? For anyone who's given a label of a psychotic illness, drugs seem to be the automatic choice of treatments as night follows day. That's all psychiatry does. It's dominated by psychopharmacologists who do nothing but manage symptoms by dispensing pills. That's it. And they don't work. But the fact that they don't work works to the advantage of the drunk companies and the psychiatrists, which means that you're not cured, which means that you're a patient for life, you're a customer, you're a client for life. And the worse your health gets, the more drugs you need. It's it's a great deal for them. We should all be up in arms about the way we're being treated by psychiatry today. This is a very dangerous industry that has gone so far overboard in inventing fictitious diseases and drugging our children and our population that I consider it to be engaged in crimes against humanity. With over 80 billion dollars a year in psychiatric drug money at stake, it is impossible to escape the saturation of psychiatric disease mongering in today's society. But behind the marketing lurks a secret psychiatry's customers would be shocked to learn. How are these drugs tested? And are they safe? No one knows precisely uh, how these psychiatric medications uh, act. We don't know if I give you a medication, if it is going to work or not. It's not a great deal of scientific support for using them. I myself, I try to pick a drug whose side effects might be useful. You have to choose what is the best option. We don't have the sure methods. There are no rules. Everything is, it's an art, really. Often it's trial and error. It's a kind of a trial and error. Maybe it's uh, trial and error. Some degree of trial and error, I guess. A blind man's bluff or something like that. Yeah. You never know if it's the right drug. It's a much more complex uh, subject. There's always going to be huge surprises. and that, That's what makes it so difficult. The best psychiatrists in the world will mess up all the time. The American public is being treated as a mass medical experiment. We are all being treated like guinea pigs by the pharmaceutical companies, the psychiatric industry and the FDA. 
They are basically testing drugs on large parts of the population uh, without really knowing what the results are going to be. It's a very dire situation that we're facing. We're talking about people's health and in many situations, people's lives. These are very serious issues. As dangerous chemical compounds, psychotropic drugs are tightly regulated by governments throughout the world. And for any new psychotropic drug to be approved for use, it must undergo tests intended to protect the public. When a pharmaceutical company develops a new drug that they want to send to the market, what they do is they have to run it through clinical trials. They have to be able to provide to the FDA safety data to say this is a safe and effective drug. In clinical trials, uh, psychiatrists are engaged to do the research. And we could bank on the fact that these psychiatrists are tied to the pharmaceutical companies. And a psychiatrist puts their name on there, they're seen as an expert, talking mental drugs, who writes them, it's psychiatrists. So that's how it works. It's a terrible system. The desperate thing about it is that it's all dressed up in the name of science. It's not science at all, it's, it's pure marketing. Uh, but they get away with it because it's called science. There's really no test, no x-ray, there's no chemistry that shows you have this condition. It's really just the opinion of someone who is probably taking money from pharmaceutical companies to prescribe drugs to people. Where's the biochemistry? Where's the research? Where's the substantiation? And the answer is it vaporizes like mist in the morning. It's not there. But the lack of scientific testing doesn't stop psychiatrists from carrying out clinical trials on dangerous drugs. Clinical trials are supposed to consist of four phases of precise scientific drug testing the first three of which must be submitted to governments for regulatory approval. In phase one, the drug is checked for toxicity. In phase two, tests are done to see how the drug reacts in the human body. If it clears this hurdle, then a phase three trial is carried out. But with no lab tests verifying or measuring any mental disorder, and with big money at stake, psychiatric drug research is highly subjective and rife with manipulation. There are many, many, many places where you can tweak the study just a little bit with the study design or with the way you gather the data or the way the data are reported. And there's so many different ways you could bias a study. I've seen what they did to the data in these trials. There's no question that they manipulated the data. For example, let's say they had 100 people to start with, 40% drop out, 30% have a positive response, 30 percent have no response, they then say that they have a 50 percent response rate when in fact most of us would say it's a 30 percent response rate because only 30 out of the original 100 really responded and so you can see that that's a little bit of a manipulation of the research data. When they design drug studies they're only looking at the one thing they want to they want to see and they don't report all the other things that are happening. Case in point, the antidepressant Cymbalta. Lilly, I believe, in February of 2004, did a clinical trial study. The people in this clinical trial did not have symptoms of depression. And in that clinical trial, there were 11 attempted suicides and four suicides completed, one of which was Tracy Johnson, 19-year-old college girl. She did not have any symptoms of depression, and yet this drug pushed her to commit suicide by hanging herself. That shoots the theory down that they say that, you know, people get suicidal because of the, you know, underlying illness that people kill themselves, that these weren't suicidal people to begin with. These weren't depressed at all. These were healthy people. A slew of media coverage followed, but psychiatrists on the FDA drug evaluation panel chose to ignore the death and went on to approve Cymbalta the following August. One of the reasons why we have underestimated the potential of some psychiatric uh, antidepressant drugs to actually trigger a suicidal kind of behavior in people is because the people who designed the research study didn't include in the research questionnaire the suicidal behavior. And then you can report that we had zero incidents of this type of behavior among our subjects. And then the response is trumpeted as if there's something magical about it, when in fact what's happened is a whole statistical 
tap dance routine that violates good science. However, on the basis of that kind of phony trial, the drug can be marketed. Keep in mind that when a drug is tested in the clinical trials, it's only a very short period of time. The final phase of testing can be anywhere from five to six weeks. The longest of those studies was eight weeks. The shortest was four weeks. So these are not long-term studies. I think most physicians and most people taking the drugs assume they're long-term, one year, two years, three year studies. They're not. They're very, very short studies. I find it pretty outrageous that we can base a multi-billion dollar industry on a few six or eight week clinical trials where antidepressant medications beat a sugar pill by a few percentage points. It is on the basis of biased research such as this that psychotropics with potentially fatal side effects are routinely approved by FDA panels for a lifetime of use. And how can this happen? Because drugs are big money and FDA panels are dominated by those who benefit by approving them. The FDA panels that evaluate these drugs are largely psychiatrists. All of a sudden you discover there are 20 different pharmaceutical companies paying them, either grants or honorary or some other way. They're getting paid by the pharmaceutical industry. If you have a psychiatrist who works at the FDA, he could also be being paid by industry. He might sit on industry panels or discussions or get paid to be a speaker. What I found in working with the physicians at the FDA was that they, they could have dual positions. They could sit on an industry board. They could be influenced by industry. If you've got 10 FDA scientists or 10 committee members, it's just a matter of six saying yes, the drug is safe, four saying no. And in almost every single case, those six saying that the drug is safe and effective always have pharmaceutical ties. They're getting paid, they're getting funded, somehow or another. Have you been diagnosed with depression and struggle with sadness, trouble sleeping, anxiety, or low energy? Ask your doctor about Effexor XR. With phase three approval of foregone conclusion, the marketing blitz begins. But while psychiatrists have already begun promoting and prescribing these drugs throughout the world, there's one more phase yet to be carried out, phase four. What phase four clinical trials are is when they've actually gotten the drug approved and then they get it into the general population so that we finally find out what it does when it hits ethnic populations, women, children. Then we see who dies who has seizures, who has deformed children, who has epilepsy, who has diseases downstream, whose heart stops. The public is the clinical trial. That's where we find out the problems with these drugs. This is an experimental stage. And it's so much so that one consumer protection group has advised patients that they refuse a prescription for any drug that hasn't already been on the market for seven years. So if you're taking a drug that's only been out for a year or two or three, you are a guinea pig. And the experimentation doesn't end here. Additional psychiatric drug trials take advantage of the invented disorders in psychiatry's diagnostic and statistical manual to rake in even more profits by targeting the most innocent of all. If they test their drugs on children, then they get a six-month extension on their exclusivity period or patent period. This psychiatric drug research center in Texas uses advertisements to lure in child volunteers. And once inside, they're further enticed with the simplest of tricks. This is where they're going to be playing. We have Game Boys, we have Xbox, we have five TVs. They come in here and they help themselves to crackers, cookies, free candy, free crackers. Everything is paid for. You don't pay for anything. But these perks are just bait to coax children into ingesting powerful psychiatric drugs known to cause suicide and violence in their own age group. These are drugs that would cost maybe several hundred dollars a month in a pharmacy. They actually are getting them free in, in research. We love children and um, we just love children because they're, they're our future. By conducting those tests on children, 
they get a financial incentive that's worth over a billion dollars. Those are the facts. You make of them what you will. With this kind of money at stake, psychotropic drug experimentation on children is rampant, with 323 studies either completed or in the works, including a 2003 trial that tested children on an antidepressant treating premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Those drugs which are barely more effective than placebos often have huge side effects which are dangerous and even deadly to people. Families don't know the risk. If they actually were aware of the risk and believed it, they wouldn't, no one would take that risk. The psychiatrist would never, she didn't say one word to me about um, what was going to be the effects of the drugs. No side effects listed, no. Well, let's sit down, we have to talk about this. At that point in time, he said, well, this doesn't have that type of reaction on any children, you know, that it's very safe. If he had told me then what I know now about it, I never would have taken it. She said, oh, Beth must have been on Paxil. That's the only way she would kill herself. And I said, well, what is this? How do people know this? I didn't know anybody would know something like that. And we went on the internet, and all of a sudden, you find out this it's not uncommon. But it's not uncommon for people to become psychotic on these drugs. We're entitled to know the truth before we give a mind-altering drug to our children, our wife, our mother, our father, ourselves. We don't really know what they're doing. That's what scares me. It's all made up theory. There are no facts about what these drugs really do. And if someone said, well, we don't know what this is going to do to you, good or bad, would you take that medication? Now that is not the practice of medicine. That's the practice of marketing. And this practice of marketing is taking lives. And the poor patient doesn't even know it. But in the testing and marketing of psychotropic drugs, money trumps safety. The top 10 most prescribed psychotropic drugs gross over $26.5 billion annually, more than double the amount of new money put into circulation every year by the United States Mint. But to make this kind of money, psychiatrists first have to convince the most crucial market segment of all, those with the power of prescription. psychiatrists specifically, they're just kind of working as sales agents for the pharmaceutical companies. There's nothing like another doctor touting the benefits of your drug to drive market share. They're an extended part of the marketing arm of these companies. Medications play a primary role. So we give drugs. Medication is a must. There's a lot of new medications. There are medications available for uh, treating VAD. Medications to use for PTSD. Antipsychotic medications. The typical antipsychotics. Benzodiazepines. Stimulants. Antidepressant medications. MAOIs. Amphetamines. Antidepressant medications. And once the medications have been balanced out, then we move on to a combination of three medicines. There's no absolute limit that is set for the number of medications. There are so many choices. Apparently, we're willing to try almost anything. Psychiatric drugs can't be sold without a prescription. So pharmaceutical companies hire psychiatrists to promote psychiatric drugs to their fellow prescribers. The money trail starts at the world's most prestigious medical schools, in the offices of highly influential, university-based, or academic psychiatrists. With their seal of approval, pharmaceutical companies make billions on psychotropic drugs. There are a lot of academic psychiatrists especially who have ties to 10 or 15 or 20 different pharmaceutical companies, and so they're making a very large amount of money. Whether they're professors or whether they work at big you know, uh, medical institutions, those drug companies will make sure that they've got them on the payroll somehow. They'll have this person feed this information to, to their other peers, uh, but it's all being motivated through monies being funded by pharmaceutical companies. About 40% of the early stage marketing dollars for pharmaceutical companies go straight to these thought leaders, psychiatrists. These financial arrangements with so-called key opinion leaders are very lucrative. A top academic psychiatrist can personally rake in over a half a million dollars per year from pharmaceutical companies. 
these people are still considered the stars of their medical centers because they bring in all this great money from the pharmaceutical companies and that helps keep the coffers of the medical center full. Universities receive a lot of money from the pharmaceutical industry. Drug companies are building buildings right next to the medical school. They're, they're funding research right and left. The University of Michigan Depression Center received, I think it was $750,000 from Eli Lilly. And all they do down there is crank out this biological view of psychiatry and mental illness and depression. With academic psychiatrists collecting millions in drug money for their universities, it is no surprise that school curricula focus on psychotropic drugs. Training programs in psychiatry, the majority of them now are drugs first. You know, you, you're really a psychopharmacologist in a way when you come out of a psych residency training program. Even when I went to medical school, psychiatry did talk to patients. Now all they do is write a prescription and send them away. A psychiatrist is trained for one purpose, to administer psychiatric drugs. Academic psychiatrists don't just indoctrinate future prescribers. They also heavily promote these drugs to their peers. First, by creating clinical trial studies, passed off as unbiased research, that push both an invented psychiatric disorder and the drug to manage it. These studies are planted in professional journals to be read by their colleagues and quoted in the media. But what readers don't know is that an estimated 50% of the time, these psychiatrists never took part in the studies. One of the most unethical practices we're aware of is ghostwriting of journal articles where somebody at the pharmaceutical company will write the paper and the academic physician will put his name on it and get it published in a major journal when he maybe changed three or four words in the whole article and the article was basically written as a marketing tool by the drug company and yet this academic puts his name on it as if he's the author. He has had no part in the study and also he probably hasn't even read the study results but he is prepared to receive ten twenty thousand dollars to put his name at the front of the research which gives it added authority. Ghostwriting is so common that even the psychiatrist running the FDA department evaluating psychiatric drug safety has attached his name to ghostwritten articles. The average physician picks that up and reads it. He believes it. And it's not a mystery that he would believe it. It seems reasonable that it's in black and white, it's in a good journal, it's in the New England Journal of Medicine, it must be true. These journals are often sent free to psychiatrists and doctors under the guise of legitimate medical research. And why are they free? Because pharmaceutical drug ads reap huge revenues for their publishers. So if you go through a medical journal, you'll see page after page of advertising for bipolar disorder and treatment of using medications or advertising for depression and the treatment of using medications, schizophrenia. So it's, it's really everywhere. I remember just a couple of years ago the first time I opened the journal from the American Psychological Association called the APA Monitor and there was a multi-page ad high gloss very expensive for Concerta which is time release Ritalin. I resigned from the American Psychological Association. I wasn't going to be part of this whatsoever. It's very hard when your major source of income is advertising and advertising placement to write an article that's negative about a particular drug and expect that company to continue to buy ads in your medical journal. So that's a major issue. But psychiatric key opinion leaders aren't satisfied with filling medical journals with ghostwritten articles. They also spread the gospel of psychotropic drugs at conferences in Continuing Medical Education, or CME. Physicians and nurse practitioners and physicians and assistants are mandated to take a certain amount of continuing education credits every year. Well, 70% of all continuing medical education is now funded by the pharmaceutical industry. That seminar is going to be taught by a professional who is employed by the pharmaceutical company. The very nature of where someone is giving you your support means you are biased to that person's side. Many physicians and many psychiatrists who attend medical conferences don't know that when they go to that conference meeting that's about antidepressants, antipsychotics, and it's generally an academic psychiatrist who's speaking, 
they don't realize that person's probably making about $10,000 for that one hour speech. But you don't have to be an academic psychiatrist to get a piece of the pie. Psychiatrists who heavily prescribe psychotropic drugs are generously rewarded by pharmaceutical sales representatives for drumming up local business. Psychiatrists, especially high prescribers, are targeted and gifted extensively by the industry. Now that gifting is where you need to get specific. That was not unusual um, during our marketing conversations to say, well, what's our top drug writer? You know, who's the doctor that's prescribing the most of this drug? Well, you know, let's send them to the Kentucky Derby. We offered trips on some occasions to come out and hear a two-hour talk, but it happened to be on a nice island in Hawaii. There were a lot of things that we did day in and day out to try to get the doctors to, to write our drugs, or in my case, to write for the psychiatric drugs. We did a lot of lunches and dinners, and we brought in speakers, and those speakers were obviously paid by us, and we would wave um, you know, renowned studies at them from renowned journals. But of course, we would never say that these, these studies were paid for by our company, and that, the, that the, it was written by a ghostwriter who was paid by our company, or that our company tends to do a ton of, of advertising within that particular medical journal, we would never say that. With over 300 million psychiatric drug prescriptions written every year, high prescribing psychiatrists are richly rewarded for opening up new markets. They receive up to 25% more pharmaceutical money than any other medical specialty. An average in one state of more than $45,000 per top psychiatrist per year. Psychiatrists get more kickback from the pharmaceutical companies than any other branch of medicine. The profession of psychiatry couldn't keep its journals afloat, couldn't keep its conferences afloat, couldn't keep its organizations afloat without money from drug companies. The drug companies really have psychiatry in their pocket. This is a profession whose diagnoses have been heavily influenced by people who are heavily influenced by the pharmaceutical industry and whose treatments are almost exclusive these days, pharmaceuticals. We should be able to count on them. I do not believe that we can. Due to the ceaseless promotion by psychiatrists, psychotropic drug prescription has permeated not just psychiatry, but the entire medical profession. But this promotional campaign has a second prong that lines the pockets of psychiatrists more than any other. And this one directly targets you. Abilify helps control symptoms of bipolar mania. Ask your doctor about Effexor XR. Axel, the most prescribed medication of its kind. Prozac Weekly is here. Zoloft, a prescription. Seraphim. PMDD. And Psychiatrists and drug companies don't hype psychiatric drugs only to fellow prescribers. They also pitch them straight to the end user. You counting on you to walk into their offices and demand a prescription. The direct-to-consumer advertising is, is instilling the notion in every human being that something is mentally wrong, something needs correction. That drives people to see a psychiatrist to help to mitigate this by dispensing the medication, by dispensing a drug that they have had pushed on them on countless television ads, countless magazine ads, and countless print ads that say, hey, there's something wrong with you, go get help for it. Nowhere is this explosion of direct-to-consumer advertising more obvious than on television. It wasn't always this way. Until recently, advertising psychiatric drugs on TV was severely restricted. But in 1997, the FDA was persuaded to relax their rules on advertising in the media, in direct violation of Article 10 of an international treaty signed at the United Nations. Every five minutes there's a new drug ad. And this, this is not by accident, this is cold, canny, scientific design. The ads are fundamentally of two types. One type of ad is a um, effort to try to get the patient to take the drug company's drug. Abilify helps control symptoms of bipolar mania. And but then the second kind of direct-to-consumer advertising is the you're sick and you didn't know it advertising. 
you could be suffering from generalized anxiety disorder because they want to create sales so what they're going to do is tell people do you have these symptoms do you have this disease do you have this particular condition but they hit it so hard on television that people say ask your doctor ask your doctor every commercial is a referral to the doctor see they're working for each other ask your doctor about Cymbalta depression hurts Cymbalta can help I can go to my doctor and say here are my symptoms and walk out with the prescription I want. I can ask for a drug by name and most of the time I'll be given the drug. So basically I'm my own doctor. The industry defends what it's doing by saying this is some kind of public health education campaign. And I'm sorry, I think if you go to an advertising agency, you're advertising. From the start, advertising psychiatric drugs on television has been phenomenally successful. In just the first three years, sales of psychiatric drugs skyrocketed by 250%. With grosses now hitting record levels, the drug industry is spending $2.9 billion a year in TV advertising alone. And once this drives people into the offices of psychiatrists, they can be hooked using another marketing ploy, free samples. The industry is willing to give out millions of dollars worth of free samples because it generates billions of dollars in sales. You want a prescription and you want Prozac written forever as a maintenance therapy. So you establish that with some free Prozac up front. Here, take this sample, it doesn't cost you anything, and then if you like it or if it seems to work, then we'll make a prescription, but you're going to have to pay for that prescription, the sample is free. So it's really a, a marketing technique. They got a cash cow. Zero refill means you've got to go back to the doctor for another consultation, for another subscription, and it just goes forever. This is business. This is money. Some direct-to-consumer marketing is camouflaged as public information. Psychiatrists regularly appear in the media, warning the public of the latest mental illness epidemics and hawking their latest breakthroughs. They write articles planted in newspapers and magazines that further their mental health awareness campaigns. Even patient advocacy groups claiming to offer unbiased information on psychiatric drugs are, upon closer inspection, pharmaceutically funded front groups managed by psychiatrists. They were started specifically by the, the industry themselves. And the public isn't informed of that. You know, it's basically a great big lie to the public that they think they're going to uh, a charitable organization that has their best interest at heart. Case in point, children and adults with attention deficit disorder, or CHAD, the biggest and most well-funded front group for the makers of stimulant drugs. Stephen Plogg is a former CHAD executive. When I became the CHAD uh, coordinator for Las Vegas, they gave me a manual, and in it it said, we want to provide unbiased information to help and support people who have ADD. For the next 30 days, we put 22 parents and their kids on a program with lab tests to find out what their causes were, eliminated their causes, they got prescription free, medication free, side effect free, and they got better with their self-esteem, and they became actually happier, healthier, and more successful. Chad found out about this, called me up and says we do not allow people to talk about nutrition in any of our seminars. We only prescribe going to a psychiatrist who will only prescribe drugs and therapy. So they said you can no longer work with us and they fired me for simply re recommending that parents go get a lab test, find out what the causes are and eliminate the causes. They do not allow that. They only allow medication and psychiatric treatment. Psychiatric patient advocacy groups also promote psychotropic drug treatment by broadly issuing public marketing surveys disguised as medical questionnaires. You can take a survey of maybe 16 questions and if you are a normal human being who's lived through ranges of emotions of normal life experience, if you've known the exhilaration of the birth of a child, a niece, a nephew, and the devastation of a divorce and the loss of dreams, and answer honestly to those questions, you will diagnose yourself as bipolar. And the instructions that come back along with the diagnosis or the warning that you're probably bipolar say, print this out and take it to your doctor. And how simple is it for anyone to go online, answer typical life questions, and be given a psychiatric disorder? Here are some randomly chosen volunteers, people of all ages leading normal lives. Do you feel sad, a little unhappy, or down in the dumps? Sometimes. 
I've had periods of great optimism and other periods of equally great pessimism. Yeah, that happens a little bit. I get tired for no reason. Sometimes. Life is pretty full. Not really. For no apparent reason, I sometimes have been very angry or hostile. It's hard for me to concentrate on reading. I am restless and can't keep still. My heart beats faster than usual. I have trouble sleeping. Shortness of breath. Gained weight. Trembling hands. I have an idea that most of these are going to be sometimes. Everyone has. As in everybody? Somewhat. Somewhat. Sure. Just a little. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. All right, my score totaled 42. Bipolar disorder, moderate to severe symptoms. Wow. The answer reflects on the presence of depressive symptoms. Currently suffering from an anxiety disorder. I may be suffering from bipolar 1. Minimal to mild depression. An obsessive compulsive disorder. Guess that means I'm a psycho. Guess I'll go to a psych. Try to see if um, I can work it out, get some meds or something. All told, 50% of these everyday people were assigned a psychiatric diagnosis and instructed to get treatment. By this measure, half of the U.S. population, some 150 million Americans, could be classified as mentally ill. Now you have a direct line of consumers just walking in with a little pre-survey that says that they potentially can have bipolar, ADHD, stress, anxiety, any of those categories. And, and they just need to take this assessment tool and say, okay, that basically that's that is what you have and here's your drug and psychiatrists are now clamoring to make such assessment tools mandatory take teen screen under the guise of a suicide prevention program mental health tests are administered in the schools to diagnose and drug children children such as Chelsea Rhodes who left for school one morning an average teenager and returned home with a psychiatric diagnosis the Rhodes family in Indiana, their, their young girl went to school one day and uh, she, all of a sudden they told her they were taking her into a room and they move her into a room and uh, give her the 10 minute teen screen test. And uh, shortly after taking the test, she's pulled aside in the hallway and she's told she has two problems, basically two mental problems. One, obsessive compulsive disorder and social anxiety disorder. Her parents were stunned, dumbfounded. They didn't know the teen screen was gonna screen their child. They had not been asked permission. The people at school had told her that she was mentally ill with these two conditions based off of a computer test that took her 10 minutes to answer. One of the questions was worded if Chelsea went out a lot. She answered no. We'd ask her why she answered that way. She said, because mom, you and dad don't allow us to go out on school nights. I have to be home to do my homework and take care of our household chores. The other question was, do you ever feel nervous or anxious when you're in front of a group of your friends or peers? Chelsea answered yes. She explained to us that because when she has to stand up in front of a group of people and give a book report in one of her classes, she's very nervous. You know, I'm 43 years old and I'm nervous in front of every one of you today, but that doesn't make me mentally ill. I believe, I absolutely believe that the survey for Teen Screen was intentionally structured to flag as many children as possible as having a possible mental health problem. And who created Teen Screen and wrote its survey? Dr. David Schaffer, a psychiatrist with extensive ties to the pharmaceutical industry. Schaffer's questionnaire is anything but scientific. In a study he himself conducted, Schaffer admitted that 84% of all students were falsely flagged as suicidal. But what was not admitted is how traumatic the consequences can be. Alea Gleason was only 11 years old when she took a screening test at her middle school in Texas. Um, it was seventh grade, and um, they had all the girls go into the cafeteria because they said that a lot of girls have depression, so they was working on some depression screen. Next thing I know, there's those middle schools tell my husband I'm that CPS is there at the school taking a layer because she's suicidal. I'm like, suicide? I'm not trying to kill myself. I love myself. I've always loved myself. So I don't know if she was even at the school or they already taken her away. When they took a layer, my girls and I, we didn't sleep for about a good three days, for the first three days, because my house was empty without her. And they was making me sign papers talking about, if you don't take these medicines, uh, you can't see your parents. 
So they were telling me, you know, if you take your medicine, you can see your parents. My daughter was on 22 different types of medication that this one psychiatrist gave her. They drugged me up so bad that they, they said they had to drag me. And I used to wonder how I got to my room. When I saw for myself what, what they were giving her and how much and how often, I just thought, they're gonna kill this child. And the parents were, were helpless. Then after a while, that's when I was just like, I'm not about to take no more medicine until I call my parents. And then that's when they was like, okay, well, we're gonna give it to you anyways. They restrained me and shot me up. I was in four points. They laid me out on my stomach and my feet like this and tied me up. One day, they, they must have put her in about 12 restraints in one day. They said I was restrained about 70 or 80 times. After a couple of months, they was like, you know, your parents don't want to see you. They don't want to talk to you or anything. So I was, I was really hurt. We tried everything. Nobody know, we know. We didn't know what hospital. We didn't even know where they took her. Taken. After two weeks, you're supposed to hear, or you're supposed to be able to see your child. They didn't give me that. I didn't see a layer to six months later. But I was a good child. I didn't deserve for that. And it messed up a lot of things. To this day, I still wish that I could just go back and be like, man, you know what? I'm not going to take the test. I would always tell every parent I see, and they was asking me, don't do the, the team screening, because it will mess up your family. Psychiatric screening programs such as these are fast on the rise. Teen Screen alone is currently screening hundreds of thousands of school children in over 500 American schools in 43 states. Has nothing to do with helping kids, has nothing to do with mental health, has nothing to do with medicine. It has everything to do with the pushing of drugs. So it presents itself as being a wonderful, altruistic uh, program, whereas in fact, I believe it's cold-blooded and cold-hearted intent is to recruit more children into the very subjective diagnoses uh, of mental illness and to treat those kids with medication. But the psychiatric drug push doesn't end in the classroom. Legislation has been put in place to screen all citizens for mental illness, including geriatric patients, war veterans, and pregnant mothers, all to be paid for by you. Psychiatrists benefit um, from both ends, from the pharmaceutical end for being paid to write the prescription, and then from the patient for being there to receive the prescription. It's an industry that cannot allow the human condition to go unmedicated. And I think this is where the problem begins. If everybody considers themselves to be sick in some way, or more than one way, and that the only control, the only hope for their happiness is to be on pills for the rest of their lives, that's the goal. The pharmaceuticals and the psychiatric community are a cleanup, and that's what it's all about. It has nothing to do with helping our kids or, you know, their mental health. It's all about money. Today, drug companies spend over $5.3 billion a year marketing prescription drugs, almost nine times more than a decade earlier. The result? Worldwide sales of psychotropic drugs have soared to $80 billion. And all while psychiatrists willfully ignore the vast human tragedy they are creating. I'm 10 years old. I'm going to read, I think, the side effects of a drug called Daytriana. The drug Adderall. Luvox. Cymbalta. Giodon. Lexapro. Namenda. I have a question. Where do I find the side effects? How do I read it if it's so small? Just a bunch of letters squished together. I can't read this. This is the side effects of the drug. Side effects. Stroke. Gastra. What the heck? Speech disorder. Eye disorders. Vision blurred. Dry mouth. Nervous. Tremor. Dizziness, delirium, and coma. Tardive dyskinesia. They experience worsening of their depression. Aggressive reaction. Paranoid reaction. Psychosis. Serious cardiovascular events. Other serious heart problems. Heart failure. What? Suicide. 
Suicidal thoughts. Suicidal thinking and behavior. Increases the risk of suicide. An increased risk of death. Sudden death. These guys must be kidding. Wow. This is a guess. Seeing this on a warning label, does anybody have any clue what they're putting their kids into? This isn't good. No drug has side effects. They're all effects. Side effect is just a way that doctors explain away the effects that they don't like or you won't like, but they're effects. These are the effects of these drugs. They're not just what might happen to you, they're what happen more often than not. We name them side effects because they're something that, they're an unintended consequence. The antidepressant drugs not only don't make you happy, they have all kinds of negative effects on the system as a whole. These drugs are absorbed and distributed throughout your entire body. So they have side effects through all of your tissues and organs, including your liver and your kidneys and your nervous system. They destroy the brain, the neural net. They, they literally kill brain cells and, and cause all kinds of brain disorders. That's why we have side, they're not side effects, they're direct effects. But while psychiatrists continually downplay the multitude of severe health risks to the public, candidly, they had no problem admitting them to our cameras. I think I tell them the main side effects. I don't tell them every side effect because there are so many possible side effects. I would say the majority of patients experience some side effects. People get side effects to every, every medication you try. They all have side effects. All kinds of side effects. Lots of side effects. Physical feelings of sickness. Headaches. Insomnia. They can't sleep. They can't eat. Drowsiness. Sedation is very frequent. Restlessness. Appetite stimulation. Neurologic side effects. Tremor or muscle spasms. Stiffness. Weight gain. Obesity. Weight gain and stuff like that. Decreased performance of sexual functioning. Sexual side effects can happen. Sexual dysfunction, etc. I've never had anybody die or anything, but I've had people faint and stuff. and it, It's really sort of unpredictable. You name it and it can be a side effect. And why can't psychiatrists predict what adverse reactions you will get? Because not one of them knows how their drugs work. At least with street drugs, people know that they're dangerous, that they should be off of them. With pharmaceuticals, people are told they're safe to take every day. But far from being safe, psychotropic drugs are increasingly being exposed as chemical toxins with the power to kill. Some of the side effects that have become of concern lately are suicide, increased risk of suicide, increased risk of homicide. These aren't people that were horribly depressed when they were given a drug. These are people who are given a drug for social anxiety or difficulty sleeping or, or mild depression and then become suicidal. And so when they become suicidal and they kill themselves, what the doctor does is go back and say, oh, well, it's because they were depressed. The label itself, the disorder, is what the, is blamed for the side effects. When in reality, it's the drug that is causing the side effect. It is the drug that is the problem. Drugs such as the antidepressant prescribed to Woody Witzak, who took it not for any mental complaint, but to help him sleep. My husband and I, um, Tim, his nickname Woody. We were married just two months shy of 10 years, so we've, you know, had a long life together. And Woody was a guy who was healthy. Um, he was a big runner. He's never had a history of depression or any other so-called mental illness. He was given Zoloft for insomnia. I find Woody one night to completely sweat through his shirt in fetal position. He kept going, Kim, you gotta help me. I don't know what's happening to me. It's like my head's outside my body looking in. Kim, Kim, help me, help me. We did breathing, um, listened to music, um, you know, prayed, anything to calm him down from his head outside his body feeling. And a week later, he was found dead hanging. Um, and it, a guy who loved life, Psychiatrists claim their drugs save lives, but according to their own studies, psychotropic drugs double the risk of suicide, with one increasing the risk by a factor of almost seven. As a pharmacist who has been studying the problem for the past seven years, I do see a glaring connection between the high use of these psychoactive substances and the rise of violence. If people knew that the mechanism was not known of these drugs, that they could 
cause, if there's a real chance for them to get a homicidal tendency or even suicide, if you take the drug, there's a chance you may want to kill yourself. And I could repeat probably a dozen other examples of significant self-inflicted harm or significant violence to others in patients who had never had that experience in their adult life. Patients such as Wyoming grandfather Donald Schell. Uh, Donald Schell was a man in his 60s, uh, a gentleman, a family man, a funny man. Um, he had had periodic episodes of depression but never any real serious mental health issues and um, became became depressed, had a, a down period, went to a general practitioner and was given Paxil. Uh, two days later, he shot his wife, his daughter, his nine-month-old granddaughter, and then himself. The first question the jury was asked, very telling question, can Paxil cause some people, some people, to commit homicide and or suicide, to which they answered yes. Donald Schell was on Paxil for only days before his murderous drug reaction. But long-term use of psychotropics has also proven to create a lifetime of damage, an unwelcome fact ignored by psychiatrists. In the long run, it may, the side effects may actually be worse than an original condition. I don't think the average patient has any idea that the long-term use of this drug is now associated with very serious diseases, with diabetes, with kidney failure, with tardive dyskinesia, a movement disorder that's very serious and permanent and irreversible. You can be affected by, by these drugs in any part of your body, your brain, your, uh, your heart, your kidneys. That's why people die early very often because they are prescribed things and the long-term effects. Uh, are, in some cases, the death of the individual. And more damage is created by polypharmacy, where psychiatrists make a fat living prescribing multiple psychiatric drugs, one to offset the effects of another. If you have drugs that create side effects, that gives you a ready market for more drugs to cure the side effects. It seems to me that it's um, a self-propagating system. And what ends up happening is that each one of those new drugs that's added into the scenario brings on another symptom for which there's another drug, for which there's another symptom, for which there's another drug. And it just snowballs into a vicious circle of one drug uh, causing the need for another drug. Sometimes people come and they're on such a cocktail of so many different drugs for so many different things. It's rare now that I see a senior citizen that is on less than five or six drugs at one time. Some 12, 15. One will lead to the next and they're all toxic. This is how the game is played. And as psychiatrists spread their lucrative game of psychotropic drugging further and further into society, children have become the latest and most tragic of casualties. Rebecca Riley, two and a half years old, they diagnosed her with bipolar disorder and ADHD. They had her on an antipsychotic, they had her on a heart drug, they say, for ADHD, and they had her on an anti-seizure. And then one other one for side effects. Four drugs at two and a half years old. She can't even zip up her own pants. She's like a little rag doll. The school nurse, two teachers, the principal, the social worker, all said they never seen any behavior in this little four-year-old girl that would warrant these kind of medications. And all specifically called this doctor and said, please take her off these. She died at a little over four years old. This little girl that didn't have a chance and the psychiatrist just let her. Instead of standing trial and facing prison time, Rebecca Riley's psychiatrist, Dr. Kayoko Kifuji, hasn't even lost her license. One might well ask how psychiatrists get away with it. The answer lies in a legal concept known as standard of care. The standard of care is based on what do other doctors do? What would a reasonable physician do in this situation? And, and the reality is that what most physicians do is prescribe medications. As long as they've done their paperwork properly and documented that, that uh, this child had the symptoms that led them to this conclusion, they appear to be completely protected from any kind of a lawsuit as a result. The standard of care is what allows doctors to seriously injure or even kill a patient 
with total impunity. So the standard of care now has been implemented to where you can get away with, if you're a medical doctor, psychiatrist, you can get away with murder. And the death count keeps rising. Psychotropic drugs now kill an estimated 42,000 people every year. The cost to society is very real and very devastating. But the medicine they're practicing isn't real. It's a hoax. Profit always comes before patient safety, and they take a very short-sighted view. Uh, it's all about how can we make money today, not what price are we going to pay tomorrow. The trail of destruction that a psychiatrist leaves in his path is of no concern to that guy. It's all about money. And the money is big. Psychiatry is today over a $300 billion industry without a single cure. And as more and more breakthroughs are promised by psychiatrists, their running total of sick, injured, and dead victims continues to escalate. Unprotected, it is the public, you, who must fend for themselves. My wife and I are blessed we have seven children. And uh, we, we love them all. They're all our favorites. Each child we have is our favorites. And uh, Beth was extremely special. She was kind, generous. She had like a really sweet and um, caring personality. She had this beautiful smile, like an inviting. She could make friends with basically any stranger on the street and get a smile or a laugh out of them. Beth was having a hard time sleeping for maybe four, five, or six weeks. And so we said, Beth, you should go to the doctor and, and get something to help you sleep. He said, OK, well, I'll try to give you something to lessen your anxiety, and it should help you sleep. Within five minutes, um, a five-minute visit, he prescribed her Paxil. When I first saw Beth right after she went on the Paxil, she was different. Like, I felt like she was drugged. And by the second or third day, she's like, I don't know, I just don't feel right. You know, I just. I feel strange in my skin. But after about three or four days, I remember that Beth was, at times, very different, like sullen, uh, keeping to herself. My mom and her were having dinner, and she said she didn't have any real emotion. Like, she kind of felt emotionally numb. She was like a different person. Like, she just seemed like she was under the influence of something. She didn't seem like herself. She seemed like she was tripping out. I talked to her on the phone and she told me she didn't want to be there. And I was like, why don't you want to be there? She's like, I just don't feel like myself. I just feel like crazy. I just feel, I just don't feel right. I truly believe that she was hallucinating maybe and going in and out of this psychotic state at this point. It seemed like she was melting down, like emotionally. She was just, she was becoming worse every day. I said, are you suicidal? I actually asked her. And she laughed at me. And she said, no, I would never do that. And I'm thinking in my mind, I'm just going to lay down next to her, and I'll rub her head, and I'll talk to her, and we'll try to figure out what we're going to do, because something's not right here. And um, my son, Matthew, was right behind me, coming up the stairs. And when I got to the top of the stairs, I saw her hanging in the hallway. Then the police were all over the place, and people were coming and going. And about three hours, four hours after my daughter died, one of my friends came over and said, you know, I was speaking to so-and-so, one of our other friends, and she said, oh, Beth must have been on Paxil. That's the only way she would kill herself. It just wasn't her. Like, there was nothing in her that would have done that. She was the most non-violent, like, gentle, it's a violent way to die. It had to be the drug. There was no other answer. If we knew what we knew now, Beth would be here with us today. I know that for a fact. The tragic story of Beth Winter is just one of many. A tale repeated wherever psychiatric drugs are prescribed. But psychiatrists insist you believe that their drugs are safe and effective because they are the mental health experts and you are not. But case after case proves that trusting them can have disastrous consequences. Psychiatry is pseudoscience. It's false science. It cannot it cannot withstand rigorous review if people would just look at the evidence. If they help anyone, it's not worth the risk to the people that, that, that are harmed by them. They are betraying every customer they have. 
They don't know what they're doing and we need to educate the public to use their feet and walk away. And how can the public become more educated? By exercising a central medical right, little known to the patient, but very familiar to psychiatrists. We want to be able to present the patient uh, with alternatives. And one of the central ideas in ethics is informed consent. The components of informed consent are letting the person know, first of all, what the diagnosis is and what it's based on so that they can say, this is why we need to, to treat you. And secondly, what the treatment is. Every patient in the healthcare system has a right to informed consent. That is, they have a right to be told the risks and benefits of the treatment, the risks and benefits of alternative treatments, and the risks and benefits of no treatment at all. Patients should be totally informed, fully informed about every medication that the psychiatrist offers to them to take or says they should take. And studies confirm that very little full and accurate information about psychiatric drugs is getting through to the public. So what would full and accurate informed consent on psychiatric drugs consist of? These medical doctors and experts have extensive experience in the subject. Their first point, psychiatric disorders are not actual diseases requiring medical treatment. It's true that there's no biological findings that really support any of these psychiatric diagnoses being medical illnesses. And the burden of proof really is the other way around. Uh, it's not that you have to prove that there is no biological science. The burden is on psychiatry to prove that there is. There's no blood test. There's no, uh, there's no lab test. There's no x-ray. These are just clusters of behavior that a group of psychiatrists have voted that it's a disease. Can you imagine doctors have to ha having to have powwows to decide if a heart attack is a, a real disease or not? No, they don't have to decide that. They don't have to have a vote on that. They should be asking the doc, geez doc, where's the, where's the chemical test for that? Where is the objective test for this? And I guarantee you that they'll be told uh, we don't have a chemical test for that. There is no such thing as a chemical imbalance and any psychiatrist that you talk to if you ask him this question they'll all admit it in private but they won't admit it in public it's a scandal so this is all subjective nothing objective about psychiatry two there is no scientific proof that psychotropic drugs resolve any mental problems since there is no measurement for these psychiatric diagnoses because they're really just subjective for the same reason there really can't be a measurement for the effects of the drug. In terms of medication, the evidence that's claimed is the medications are highly effective uh, and not very toxic. But actually, in fact, the data in psychiatry are very clear that that's not true. What is true is that the medications are barely, if at all, more effective than placebo. You're selling drugs to people under false premises, under a disease that's been invented. So how do you measure efficacy among a disease that doesn't even exist. Three, psychotropic drugs mask symptoms and come with severe short and long-term side effects. Whatever problem you're being treated for, whether it's depression, real or otherwise, or cardiovascular disease, medicating away the symptoms is not solving the problem. The patent medication gives the appearance of having helped because in the short term, it usually doesn't show the bad effects that are going to happen in the long term. So it's very deceptive. The longer the patient's on the medication, the worse the prognosis is. None of these medications hit precise targets. You begin accumulating all kinds of collateral damage. In other words, other organs in the body are actually harmed. So for the first time, we're seeing kids in grade school or middle school who have type 2 diabetes and who have the beginning stages of cardiovascular disease. So you see Parkinson's disease, you see tardive di dyskinesias, you see other movement disorders. Is it true that we're now seeing a lot of death from psychiatric drugs? Absolutely, yes. Four, psychotropic drugs can cause dependency and addiction. One of the hallmarks of informed consent with psychiatric meds is 
you have to discuss the potential for addiction. The vast majority of psychiatric drugs create psychological and, and physical dependency. Most patients that I've seen that were on these drugs have difficulty getting off of them. It's rare for somebody to just be able to stop it without a problem. Five, most mental problems are caused by an underlying physical illness. Many physical conditions can cause mental problems or what pose as psychiatric symptoms, but the psychiatrist, in the records I've reviewed, psychiatrist does not do an in-depth study of what could be causing the problem. And if the doctor isn't taking the time to find the cause of those symptoms, then unfortunately those symptoms may continue and there may be a serious underlying medical disorder that's being overlooked. The question is, is it better to treat depression uh, with a drug or is it better to, to treat depression by trying to figure out what caused the depression and working it out with the patient. Dehydration can make you exhibit symptoms of depression. Sleeplessness can make you exhibit symptoms of depression. Eating a terrible diet, hypoglycemia, being sedentary, all of these things are biological reasons for having symptoms of depression. And I have in my practice children who are misdiagnosed as having ADD, ADHD, who really have uh, Lyme disease. Seventy percent of all what are classified as mental illnesses actually have a physical cause, a physical problem causing that. Six, no matter how severe the emotional or psychological distress, there are many effective options that do not involve psychotropic drugs. Once you've proven that there is no problem in the body and that there is no malfunction in the brain, then you have to begin to address these other levels of the self. And I think that's what psychiatry has completely stopped doing. There are very few conditions that cannot be treated by other methods than the use of drugs. Any forces that impinge on medicine that make us think that the drug approach is the only approach is undermining good patient care. And because most non-drug options are rarely told to patients, true informed consent is almost never given. When you get into informed consent, it's almost a, a responsibility of the patient to make a, a, an inquiry about the, the hazards of the drug and not rely on, on what the uh, psychiatrist or physician tells them. We can't go in and abdicate our responsibility as consumers simply because somebody has an MD after their name or someone is a psychiatrist and we think they know more than we do. The best way to protect yourself is is to educate yourself, is to ask questions not only of your doctor, but to, to, to do your own research. Don't be ignorant, be informed. Get information from as many places as you can. That's how you'll be an intelligent, skeptical consumer, and that's how you will protect the safety of yourself, your children, and your entire family from this industry of death known as modern psychiatry. And as modern psychiatry has permeated our world over the last 50 years, so too has psychotropic drugging. But there is a way to expose this medical abuse. By reporting all complaints and adverse psychiatric drug reactions to your National Drug Regulatory Agency. MedWatch is the federal reporting program in the United States. MedWatch is a voluntary reporting system, a passive reporting system where doctors, patients, healthcare providers, pharmacists, anybody really can make a report saying that they think that um, what they experienced or what their patient experienced was an adverse drug effect. And this is what we call post-marketing surveillance and this begins to get a look at what the side effects of uh, long-term or chronic use of these uh, drugs really is. The FDA admits that probably only 1% of all the adverse drug effects are actually reported by patients or physicians. It is only through the reporting of all adverse drug reactions that the true scale of the horrors of psychotropic drugging will come to light. You have the facts. Share this video with your doctor and don't allow yourself, your friends, or your loved ones to become the next statistic of the big business of psychotropic drugging. To find out more about psychiatry and psychotropic drugging, or to report a case of psychiatric abuse, contact the Citizens Commission on Human Rights.